engage your brain and enter the mind's eye, an audio auditorium of audacity. I'm your host, DJ BJ Turnoff, representing the Z Talk radio crew. We're back from way too long of a summer break. All of you loyal listeners who I just love, cherish, and adore, I know you're rolling your eyes at me right now after I use the word break. Uh, Did I say summer break? I'm sorry, I meant summer season. Well, let me at least explain, I've been a little busy. I upped and moved from Los Angeles in the beginning of July, and about six weeks later, landed in Charm City, Baltimore. In between, I was doing a U.S. National Parks tour and seeing some of the Pacific Northwest. Then, as you can imagine, when I did land in Baltimore, I had to find a place, set it up, and make this sweet studio, which you're hearing right now. All of a sudden, last week was Halloween, a couple weeks away from now, Thanksgiving. I don't know what the hell happened of time. I know, no excuses, so I gotta make it up to you, starting with this episode as a way to give thanks to you for your patience and your listenership, of course. Former park ranger Andrea Lankford, she's gonna make the long trek to the mind's eye to pull the curtain on the U.S. National Parks Service. Andrea is gonna present an unfiltered, behind-the-scenes peak of our national parks that you're not gonna hear anywhere else, all featured in her captivating book, Ranger Confidential, Living, Working, and Dying in the National Parks, which delves into the trials, tribulations, and the triumphs of today's park rangers. And sadly, before reading, I thought life as a park ranger was like spending the day with Yogi the Bear at Jellystone Park, but now I really understand it's more like a day as Leonardo DiCaprio's character when he gets manhandled by that bear in The Revenant. As a ranger, Andrea won several awards for her work as a criminal investigator, so we're going to take a big look at crime and law enforcement on the national parks, murders, missing people, and even white-collar crime. All the stories you hear are going to be factual from government documents, testimonies from employees, and her own experiences at the Grand Canyon, Yosemite, and other national parks. Go fill up that canteen with lots of water. It's going to get hot in here as we reveal the real R-rated ranger life when we return. This is The Mind's Eye on Z-Talk Radio. Feed your head with the Mind's Eye Media. Now, remember when I said that I moved from L.A. to Baltimore, and in between I was doing that Pacific Northwest tour of the national parks? And I don't want to pat myself on the back too much, but I did take some pretty phenomenal pictures of the Grand Canyon, Glacier National Park in Montana, which is just gorgeous, Big Sur, and some of my adventures that I had in Seattle, Deadwood, Portland, and more. Uh, you, you might also get a kick out of seeing last week's official Houdini seance, which was the first time ever in Baltimore I got a chance to be there. Check them out right now on our Instagram page, at Minds Eye Show, again, at Minds Eye Show. Or you can check out some of our latest news articles geared specifically for you Earth junkies. you find out why Japan's cherry blossoms are blooming in fall months ahead of schedule. Or even take a gander at the weirdly perfectly rectangular iceberg spotted by NASA recently. Same info as before for Facebook and Twitter. Again, that's at Mind's Eye Show. You'll see how much the beauty of the nature from the national parks this summer inspired me uh, to bring that back to the Mind's Eye environment. So strap up your boots because up next, former ranger Andrea Langford takes us on a behind-the-scenes guided tour of the national parks and her masochistic adventures inside. This is the Mind's Eye on Z Talk Radio. We'll return shortly. Andrea Langford, 12-year National Park Service veteran, hikes by the Mind's Eye trailhead to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of life as a ranger in the U.S. National Parks. Andrea, thank you so much for joining the Mind's Eye. Hi, Brian. Hi, so glad to have you on here. I can't wait to talk about uh, Ranger Confidential. Um, But before we do, I just got to know, how's that sweet California weather right now? Oh, it's so nice. We've got fall colors, but the highs are in the 70s. So oh. it's it's very perfect right oh, now. I'm so jealous. I, I was living in California. I was living in L.A. about two and a half months ago, or about four months ago, and I moved to Baltimore about two and a half months ago. And I, living in L.A., I don't think I saw the rain for two and, a half mo- uh, two and a half years. I've seen more rain in two and a half months in Baltimore than I did in the two and a half there. So Yeah, um, I believe. <laughs> I'm dreaming a little bit about that California weather, but... Um, so let's talk about your book, uh, Ranger Confidential, Living, Working, and Dying in the National Parks. And you're truly, I mean, exquisite storytelling. 
Um, I laughed. I cried. I even felt like I had vertigo uh, <laughs> at different points. Um, but I think the one thing that I walked away most from the book was I really had a whole new level of respect and appreciation for rangers. I mean, they really are real heroes. Uh, before, in my mind, I thought it was more like Yogi Bear and Jellystone. Uh, but now I kind of understand the reality is really more like The Revenant. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't mind, uh, just kind of describe the difference between fact and fiction, or I guess how most people envision your job as what the actual reality of it is. Yeah, I know it, you know, there's, there are moments where it's that postcard fantasy, the best job in the world, you know, where you're looking at the scenery, you're living amongst the scenery, but also the longer I was a ranger, the longer I saw, there was also a lot of horrifying moments, sad moments, frustrating moments, and people just didn't realize it. You know, rangers are often stopped by the public and they say things like, you know, you should pay us for allowing you to work in this beautiful place mm -hmm. or, you know, um, you got the best job in the world when in reality you're getting paid in sunsets and the work can be really hard on you both physically and psychologically. And most of the time you probably don't even really get to see those sunsets too. So you don't even get paid that way either. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> it's happening behind you. <laughs> and, and I thought just kind of, I don't know if funny is the right term, but Something that's, I guess, emblematic of the discrepancy between reality and fiction is, is the iconic Smokey the Bear Stetson hat that you guys wear. And a, a funny point that you brought in is that, or in the book, is that after 20 minutes of, of wearing it, it's uncomfortable. Why do they make you wear those hats? They, they can make you have more comfortable hats, couldn't they? Well, sometimes they'll let you wear a ball cap. And when you're backpacking in the backcountry on a backcountry patrol, you can wear the baseball cap. But when you're in the public eye, you must almost always wear the Smokey Bear Stetson. But, you know, most rangers are glad to do it. We, are, we have a pride in that hat, even though it gives you a headache sometimes. You still <laughs> feel very proud to wear that hat. So it's, it's sort of an ambivalent feeling of loving it and hating it at the same time. I can kind of understand that when I was uh, visiting the Grand Canyon a few months ago. I was wearing, I guess, a similar style hat of sorts to the Stetson, uh, but it clearly wasn't a ranger's hat. And I was wearing athletic wear, but people kept coming up to me and asking for directions or, or you know, that dreaded sunset question that I know you guys hate. Um, yeah. And after a while, I had to tell them, you know, I kept telling them I wasn't a ranger, but they kept looking <laughs> at me weird. And I was just like, all right, after a while, I just I just told them whatever they wanted to hear and, and had them on their merry way. So I guess I, I don't know if I should apologize to you or, or, or not, though, for that. So on no, I, I'm sure at the Grand Canyon, the Rangers would be grateful for you to do some work for them like that. Oh, gladly, gladly. But, uh, I mean, you guys, I don't think I could do, I don't think I can cut it, quite frankly, after reading the book. Um, so um, I thought another interesting part, and we're going to talk, of course, about the stories, and, and, um, and we're also going to come on to, we're also going to talk about crime in a little bit. But I just want to probe a little bit deeper personally. Uh, Ranger Confidential, it, it follows the lives of you and, you know, I guess about five to seven other rangers um, and I guess their attempts to, to move on up in the national parks ranking and move around the parks itself. And I guess from reading it, it seemed that they all had a, a call of duty to the job, at least in some sense, while you, you pointed out that you didn't really feel that call until you were already a ranger. Do you mind extrapolating a little bit on that? Yeah, that's very true for me. I got a degree in forestry and I wasn't really sure. I knew I wanted to work outdoors, but I wasn't really sure in what capacity. I even applied for a job, you know, with a timber company. Um, I very much wanted to work with animals and had worked at a zoo prior. But I got into the park service because a boyfriend was working at Cape Hatteras and he encouraged me to come out there and work with him. But once I started, I fell in love with the job. I, I loved responding to emergencies. I loved the law enforcement aspect. And I really became a believer when I started protecting the sea turtles, the endangered sea turtles at Cape Hatteras. They really moved me as an endangered species. That's when I knew how high the stakes were and how important it was what park rangers do. And from the outside looking in, that may not sound that important, but tell a little bit more about that story because I, I thought it was a it was a really beautiful and touching story with the turtles. 
Yeah, well, you know, they gave me the day shift, the early morning shift. I had to get up at five in the morning and patrol the beach, and they told me to look for tracks. And so I would go and look for these turtle tracks. And when I first saw them, I, they were huge, and these animals are huge. And the mother turtle lays her nest there in the beach at Cape Hatteras. Sometimes those nests are laid in the wrong place. It's too too popular area of the beach or it's below the tide line. So I would have to move the turtle nest and take 80 to 100 turtle eggs and very carefully carry them to another place and bury them. Then 85 days later, I saw one of these nests hatch and all the little baby turtles were coming out and there might be 80 turtles come out of this nest. They're about the size of a silver dollar. They're bruise colored, they're purple. And they were just so cute and vulnerable. And only about one of those 80 baby turtles were gonna make it. Uh, seagulls come down and eat them. They get run over by uh, four wheel drive, ATVers on the beach. Uh, in the water, they get eaten by fish. So when I was holding one of these really vulnerable turtles, I just knew we really need to work hard to protect them so that we always have sea turtles in the world. And that's what park rangers do at Cape Hatteras. So I was very moved by that. Uh, I was, yeah, I definitely wanted to start off with that. I mean, it was a beautiful story in the book, and I wanted to start off on, the, on a nice positive foot because uh, we are going to talk a, you know, a lot about some negative, negative stuff and, and issues that you encounter, and of course, crime. But I guess it really wasn't that uplifting on some level because you did say about one out of <laughs> only one survived. So um, let's uh, we'll come back to some more positive stuff that actually is positive. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's a mantra that is repeated multiple times in the book, uh, and it's going to guide our conversation because it's kind of the overarching uh, theme. Uh, keep the people from the park, the park from the people and the people from themselves. Uh, articulate what that means to uh, to a ranger. Yeah, that's the ranger motto, and a law enforcement ranger is called a protection ranger, and it's protect the people from the park, protect the park from the people, and pre- protect the people from each other. So a park ranger gets stuck in between all of that. You're protecting a park that sometimes kills the people visiting it. And sometimes the people damage the park that can be dangerous toward them. And sometimes the people try to hurt each other or get themselves hurt. So it's like a thin green line and things are coming at you every which way and you're trying to protect everything there. And that may give you an idea of how stressful sometimes the job can be. Yeah, I mean, working in in a set of beauty isn't so great when you got... um the the things that you had to encounter around there um uh, so let's let's go into that a bit in the book um ranger confidential you mainly jump around between the grand canyon and yosemite i want to start with the grand canyon because that's the one i've been to so uh, i guess i'm most intimate with it uh so i guess the biggest question for me andrea above all is where do you think the best place to see the sunset is? Oh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. You're yeah, trying right. to give me a hard time. <laughs> no, uh, FYI, guys, uh, <laughs> listeners, tip number 57 from book, and there's millions of tips in there that are, are useful. Never ask a ranger that question. I uh, Once you point that out, I felt like an ignoramus because uh, I did a, a National Parks tour uh, this this summer, and that was, of course, the first question I would ask every single <laughs> ranger. So, uh, again, another uh, apologies for that. But, uh, but in seriousness, uh, y- you said in the in Ranger Confidential about Grand Canyon that it was your favorite. You you have a a bit of a a love hate relationship with Grand Canyon. Why do you say that? The part the Grand Canyon is just so in your face. It's so beautiful. It's this abyss that challenges your concept of yourself in the world. Um, It's just, it's so challenging yet thrilling to hike in. Um, But it's also one of the deadliest parks in the nation, if not the world. Uh, It's also one of the busiest parks rescue and law enforcement wide in the U.S., in the national park system. So many rangers, you know, when I first got there, they'd say the Grand Canyon chew, will chew up a park ranger and spit you out. And that it was true for me. 
And I think Chris Four is uh, one of the other Rangers featured in the book. If off the top of my head, he said that if he doesn't get out of the Grand Canyon, it's going to kill him. I mean, did you feel that way too? Yeah, there were times that the park scared me, and that's sort of the weird paradox of being a park ranger in a park like Grand Canyon or Yosemite. It's so beautiful, you love it. It's your it's your temple. It's your religion. But there are also times you're afraid you're going to die in that park because you're doing such dangerous work. You know, I just got a tweet today in the medical, the American Federation of Government Employees says the National Park Service in 2017 is among the top 10 dangerous jobs in the federal government. Hmm. I believe that. And I think you brought up two stats um, in the book that uh, I think if you were like a parks ranger, you have like a 10 times more uh, likelihood of, of being assaulted while on job. Um, something to that effect. It, it... Yeah, the, the, the stats change by the year, but just to state how dangerous being a law enforcement park ranger is, is you at, at times, and when I was there, you are 12 times more likely to be killed on the job as a park ranger as you are as a special agent with the FBI. And you mentioned Chris Fors. You know, he was worried the Grand Canyon was going to kill him. Where did he go to work? He went to work for the FBI. Hmm. He thought that would be an easy job compared to being a park ranger. Yeah, it just goes to show you how, how really dangerous it is and that discrepancy that we were talking about. Um, it's just as, I mean, as beautiful as it is, it, it's, it's probably equally, if not more, treacherous. Um, and I, re- I remember, though, I remember being at the Grand Canyon. It's funny, you see it on the pictures, and, you know, it looks amazing. Your, your brain can't comprehend it. And even when you're there, your brain can't comprehend it. It's, it's so gorgeous. It even looks fake when, when you're sitting right in front of it. I just couldn't get my mind over that. It was, it was weird. Um, but the Grand Canyon, it says it's been known to, to guard many riches. I mean, there's ancient ruins. There's petroglyphs, fossils, hidden caves and springs. And, and it doesn't give up these treasures easily, as a, I'm sure you can attest to. And I remember... One story from the book, you trying to hike to, um, I believe it was a Native American um, area called Sipapu, the gate to the underworld. Tell us a little bit about your attempts and, and if you ever ended up getting there. Yeah, I think to preface that, it's important to know that I have a science degree. I'm a skeptic, but there is one area in the Grand Canyon that I'm very superstitious about, and that is the Sipapu, um, the Hopi Native American tribe, they see it as the place of emergence of their people, but is also the gateway to the underworld. And it's a mound deep in the Grand Canyon. I won't even give you a clue to where it is because I don't want anybody to go there. You know, I'm that scared of that place. Um, But, you know, the way the legend is, is that whites and especially women aren't supposed to visit the Sea Papu. And even for the Native American tribe, you're supposed to be spiritually prepared before you go. And Grand Canyon Rangers told all kinds of stories about that place. Uh, People who got struck by lightning after visiting it, uh, people who died in a flash flood while visit after visiting it. Um, People who went crazy after visiting it had a manic breakdown. But I did decide to try to see this place one day and it takes two days to hike there. And I got close to it within a quarter of a mile and I just had a very foreboding dread come upon me and a, just a voice inside me said, turn around, don't go. And that's what I did. And I still to this day haven't been there and I'll never go there. And, and that was actually multiple times you tried going there. Um, why, why won't you go back? Cause like you said, you're, you know, you come from a scientific background. Um, is it really just the, the gut instinct that you just won't, cross that line I guess that's what got you here this so far right I think all all of my time in the national parks and understanding the Native American histories in the national parks and then rescuing so many people and pulling out more bodies than I can keep track of out of the parks I begin to develop a healthy respect for Native American legends about dangerous places and so even today, if a place, you know, if there's stories of a place being cursed um, uh, or haunted by a Native American type demon or curse, I don't want to go there. I respect it. 
Yeah, I guess you'd always rather be uh, safe than sorry, as they say. Yeah, or if I do go, I, I just doll up my um, caution more, I'm more careful. The one thing that I re- also took away from visiting the Grand Canyon was of the national parks that I did visit, um, they really embraced that uh, Native American side, uh, you know, history to it. So I think they do just a, a, a wonderful job with it. Um, I'm sure you... How do you feel? I mean, uh, did they did you learn a lot about the Native American traditions while living there and embrace it more while you were living there? Yeah, I, well, I think so. I think, um, you know, at the Grand Canyon, we had some Navajo and Hopis that we work that worked with us. Um, and they don't they really they also fear the Grand Canyon as much as they love it. And some of them will refuse to go below the rim after dark. Hmm. Um it's a spiritual place to them and it should be handled with uh, sort of a mixture of respect and fear. Why, why wouldn't they go down below the rim uh, after night? What's uh, is there some type of, um, you know, legend there? Yeah. Well, they, they believe that it's um, how can I put it? Some believe that there's uh, spirits that live in there. There's a certain spirit that hangs around down the bottom of Grand Canyon that'll click rocks. And sometimes he appears as a handsome man, and then he turns, and he's this ugly, hideous beast. Um, so, yeah, there are legends of creepy things down there. Um, but the reality is that it's dangerous down there. People die down there every year. I worked there during the deadliest hiking season in the park's history. Uh, so it's somewhat healthy to have a, just a little bit of fear of a place like the Grand Canyon. Now, coming from that science background, and I always, uh, you know, I want to get your opinion. I always thought that the Native American legends were always really interesting. And, you know, it's an oral tradition, so they pass it down. And they got to pass down really important information, so they do that through story narration. And the story that behind the Grand Canyon, to me, seems to match the scientific history of it. Uh, you know, they talk about the first world where it was brought down by fire, and, you know, that would, I guess, how the canyons would start forming. And then um, then a great flood, uh, you know, and then the, the second world was destroyed by water, and then they came out the third world from the darkness, you know, out the rim. So to me, I always think it's interesting how it seems that the Native American lore, on some level, if you look at it objectively, does match some scientific aspect to the creation of the Grand Canyon. Did you notice that as well, or am I just crazy? No, I, I kind of couldn't agree with you more. I think it, metaphorically, if you want to, you know, respond on a skeptical, you know, from the level of a skeptic, you know, the metaphoric um, message in those stories is strong. And, and when you're ready to move to Yosemite, the legends are even more mm-hmm. powerful about the that relate to the dangers of Yosemite and and I've always thought maybe the park service should put up signs telling these legends right where there's people who are often falling off waterfalls, for example, at Yosemite. Because in Yosemite, the Native Americans tell a story of a spirit called Pahono, which means evil wind. And they have a story where he, this evil wind entices you to the edge of a waterfall at the top. And you know, at Yosemite, those waterfalls are hundreds of feet high. And entrances you to the edge of that waterfall and then pushes you off. Every year, there's people who die that way at Yosemite. If I recall correctly, less than three weeks ago, there was another couple, um, I believe it was an Indian couple who, do, you know, does travel blogging, who fell off the, the side of uh, a cliff on Yosemite just, you know, and, and you hate to hear it, but, you know, they were just taking a selfie to, to get that, you know, I guess that crazy looking selfie. I, I mean, to me, I, I just don't get that, I, that type of stuff. Why, yeah. Why? Why? Why risk it yeah. for for nothing? In my opinion. Yeah, it's part. You know, the selfie is kind of a new thing. I just read there's been at least maybe 285 people who have fallen to their deaths or been killed trying to take selfies in dangerous areas. And that most latest one at Grand Canyon was was quite sad. Hmm. Uh, but yes, the scenery is enchanting. And sometimes that enchantment can take you too far and you get yourself in trouble. Yeah, it seems like, uh, you know, the two big ones, Yosemite and, and Grand Canyon, they seem to 
to breed disaster and, and different type of disasters too. And with Grand Canyon, and to me, it seems like there was, it had its fair share of plane crashes. And if I remember my visit correctly, uh, at the desert watchtower, uh, there's a plaque that says uh, something about the FAA was created from a plane, uh, plane crash that originated in the Grand Canyon. Is, is that right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's an area called Crash Canyon. Uh, right off the top of my head, I forget the date. I want to say in the 1960s, perhaps. And two big airliners crashed. Guess where they were flying over the Sea Papu? Mm. The area of the Sea oh, Papu. Wow. The confluence, which is near the Sea Papu, the Colorado River. And uh, I want to say about 150 people died there. Some of their bodies are still in there. A friend of mine who's a ranger had a really weird experience when camping there. And she saw people at night that were walking to some site and other people falling behind them speaking in a Native American tongue. Um, other people reported uh, disturbing experiences near Crash Canyon. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of those stories. Uh, and I think that's something that you do focus on another book, um, Haunted Hikes, right? Yes, you're right. And, uh, you know, we won't touch on that, but I may hold you, if you don't mind, I'm going to hold you maybe a Halloween episode next next year. Okay, sure, you got it. All right, I'm going to hold you to that then. But... Um, and so just coming back to the disasters with, with, with the Grand Canyon and, and that we see at National Park, we were talking about the FAA and its creation. Um, I think there was one chapter we, where um, there was a rescue, search and rescue attempt on a plane crash that you were a part of. Yeah, I, well, I responded to several plane crashes. There's a helicopter crash that I responded to and and. Uh, Thankfully, those people all survived. And also tell the story of when Chris Fors, a park ranger who's a friend of mine, he's now retired, and he responded to a crash and several people died, but uh, one young woman made it. They rescued her and she was burned over a large percentage of her body, but she made it. Still, it was a horrifying experience for Chris and the other rangers. Um, and they're... they're I, kind of lost track of how many crashes I responded to. Some of them were fatal. Um, and I responded to one where it involved uh, rescuers, not park rangers, but nurses and medics in a plane that crashed on a peak there near Flagstaff. Uh, seeing the stuff, you know, seeing everything that you saw, I mean, death after death, uh, how did you deal with that? You know, I mean, I know that their gallows humor was a bit uh, pervasive through the through the book, but how did you personally deal with, with all this tragedy that you kept seeing and having to deal with? You, you tend to, well, I tend to just sort of, well, when you're so busy, you didn't have a whole lot of time to contemplate it. And I tend to just not go there, but look, you know, and, and then to tell those gallows humors jokes. Um, but looking back on it, I don't think that was the, you know, I say it's like, uh, putting a Band-Aid on it, what will become a festering wound. Um, so, yeah, we didn't necessarily deal with it in the most healthiest way at the time. You know, we drank a lot, we partied a lot when we were off duty, too much. Yeah, you got to let loose after after that stuff. But, uh, you know, after seeing those plane crashes, and then I think he, there was one where there was a Thelma and Louise inspired um, suicide attempt at the Grand Canyon too, uh, and, and I think some of the bodies like looked like accordions, if I recall correctly. I don't, Andrew, I really don't know know how you did it, uh, and you know, I just want to say on behalf of everybody, thank you for 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 doing that for the twelve years that you did. Oh, that, I appreciate that. Yeah, sometimes I don't know how I did it either. <laughs> Uh, especially after just the, the constant stupidity from people. I mean, one thing I kept saying to myself while reading is, my God, how stupid are people? I I just don't understand. And in, in the two hour in the in my visit to the Grand Canyon, in just a couple hours of, of doing of, of being there, my first couple hours of being there, I remember seeing somebody walk the fence uh walk the fence uh like a tightrope, uh and there's only centimeters separating them from from certain death i remember going on the bright angel trail um and someone hiking down in in and this is in the middle of july uh someone walking down and p 
pants and no water. And I just was astounded. I just, I just, and that's what kept coming back to me is, my God, how, how stupid are people? Can you comment on that? Why, why are people so dumb when they get to the national parks? I, yeah, we used to talk about people leaving their brains at home when they went on vacation. We tried our best to warn people. You know, we used to put big signs up with a skull and crossbone. You know, there's all these dangers. Carry all these things in your backpack. And people would go and smile and get their picture taken in front of the sign. In fact, one body that was found in the park, this was before cell phones, but they developed the film in his camera. And it, he's dead now. And they developed the film in his camera. There was a picture of him grinning in front of that sign. I, yeah, we tried. It was very frustrating at times um, because we were overworked to begin with. So we were hoping people would do their part to keep themselves safe. And and they didn't. And uh, yeah, I just I just kept oh my my god the stupidity of people and and in regard to the to you kept having to save people. I mean, there was one quote in the book. Saving lives at the Grand Canyon was like pushing a wheelbarrow filled with precious stones up a steep and bumpy trail. I, I imagine you must have felt like Sis Sisyphus, uh, you know, rolling up that hill, that boulder up uphill, only to keep watching it roll back down for eternity. That you nailed it. It felt exactly like that. And so there are times when I, myself and the other rangers, we lost our patience with the certain park visitors and they weren't too happy about that but sometimes we verbalized our frustration also to our managers and completely understandable i mean to me when you when you say when you when you say something like that you know to me it sounds like this the job was laborious and futile and and obviously laborious nobody can doubt that but definitely not futile i mean in my eyes andrea you're a real hero so i hope you don't think it is it, or was futile at all uh, you, you know, I mean, one of the happy endings is after that really deadly hiking season, I, me with another group of rangers, we all worked together. And with the support of our superiors, we created a preventative search and rescue campaign that they're still using today. Uh, there's never been as many hiker deaths since then that equal the amount that happened prior to that campaign. Um, that, that it's grown, it's even more improved now. So we did, we saved lives through prevention um, and it works. So I'm very proud of that, to have been a part of that team that created the PSAR campaign. And let's stick with uh, one more positive story before we hit the commercial and start talking about crimes within the park. Uh, one of my favorite chapters from the book was uh, chapter 17 about the teenage boy who, who fell off a cliff uh, about 70 feet. Uh, you mind recalling that story for us? And, and then we'll, we'll head into the break after that. Let's go out on a positive note before the commercial. Yeah, that was a, that was a scary one. Late at night, a uh, young boy got up to go to, he was camping in a very remote area of the park, the canyon, and got up to go to the bathroom and slipped and fell off a cliff about 70 feet down. But the rangers who worked for me, heroic, awesome rangers, they ran out there and it was touch and go. He had hypothermia and they got a helicopter. They had to get a helicopter and lower a ranger in on a rope to haul him out of there. It was very dangerous, but they got that boy out and saved his life. So that, that kind of thing happened all the time. You know, for all the dark, scary bodies we had to recover, there were 10 or 20 or more people we saved. And I think that one hit me really hard because... You know, it was story at that point in the book. Uh, it was seemed like it, there was a it was a big sandwich of positive stuff. There was a lot, there was a lot of um, you know deaths and and everything that we've been talking about. Uh, so you know, in my mind, I was expecting another tragedy. And then when you guys saved the boy's life, I I couldn't have been more elated. And and it hit me hard. And obviously, that's obviously reflective of your storytelling too, not just the story. So. Um, that was just, you know, a really good story uh, to, to go because we, we have been talking about so much negative stuff. Um, and I guess let's switch gears to, to some of that negative stuff before um, before we do go out on the commercial break. Um, let's start talking a little bit about crime. As a ranger, you won several awards for your work as a criminal investigator. Um, and I guess people wouldn't think this, but really the same crimes that happen outside of the park happen inside the park, but with less manpower. I mean, what were some of the crimes and, and more heinous crimes that you had to deal with as a ranger? 
Well, there were assaults. Uh, there have been rapes, uh, child abuse. Um, I personally wasn't involved with the homicide investigations, but there's been several cases of the parks I worked in where husbands pushed their wives off a cliff in order to get the insurance money. That happened at the Grand Canyon, uh, probably happened in Yosemite. And recently there was a conviction where it happened in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, the, the, you know, criminals go on vacation, too. And then all the problems in society, just like domestic abuse or just people fighting, people drinking too much, people doing drugs, um, drugs being sold in the parks. It, it's just all the same problems. You know, Yosemite, you know, is like a town. There's a jail there. There's two swimming pools, lots of hotels, lots of campgrounds, a lot of employees that live there. And sometimes the concession employees are the problem. Sometimes the park service employees themselves are the problem. One of the awards I won was for uh, starting an investigation that ended up in the capture of a park ranger who was embezzling from the government. It's just a wide range, even I guess even white collar crimes are. It sounds like uh, happening inside exactly. the national park. Something that you wouldn't exactly. even think. Um, and even I, I think there was one story about Danny Ray hoarding a prison escapee who who came through Grand Canyon. Yeah, that one takes the cake. Yeah. Um, I, I was actually at Zion National Park at the time, but they called me to help because that was the largest manhunt in Arizona state history. But this, he was a whack job and a murderous, homicidal maniac dude. Um, he had a history of child abuse. And he started just taking people hostage and, you know, in, they'd end up getting let, he'd end up letting him go. And long story short, he ends up in the Grand Canyon. He tries to take some people hostage. And Chris Fors and some other rangers that I worked with, they try to catch him. And he's, you know, driving off with these people and he shot at them. Uh, the bullet went so close to Chris Fors, he heard his, his ears ring. And they end up chasing him and he lets his hostage go and he runs off into the park. And so that started this big manhunt that lasted for weeks. And that's how I ended up there. And I ended up following with carrying the shotgun, backing up the Border Patrol agents that were following his trail with bloodhounds. But Danny Ray Horning, he, you had to hand it to him. He was pretty savvy. He would do things to evade the dogs. We heard he was wearing socks over his shoes so that we couldn't track him. Um, in the end, he ended up taking more people hostage and, and escaped by hiding in the back seat while two women from England drove him out of the park. But he was a very dangerous guy. Somebody could have easily have got killed during that. Um, fortunately, they didn't. He's now on. He's now here in California in prison for homicide. He had uh, dismembered a catfish farmer. I guess he was in business with or something. Uh, and is he going to be in jail for the rest of his life, or is this some guy we're going to have to worry about at the Grand Canyon, you know, uh, fifteen to twenty years from now? Yeah, I believe he was sentenced to death, but that believe they're not they repealed the death penalty in california so he'll never be um he'll never get the death penalty but i'm sure he's in for life i doubt he's gonna come out all right well at least that's reassuring on, on yeah. some level <laughs> a little bit normally the justice system fails us completely but at least uh, that's nice to hear uh, but let's hold it right there when we come back we're going to talk about crimes uh we're going to talk about another criminal issue that the national parks is dealing with now uh, and seems to be garnering attention, a lot of attention in the news. Uh, it's the high number of strange, unsolved missing persons cases. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk with Angia about her research into these mysterious National Parks disappearances and the cases that she's involved with. Of course, more stories from Ranger Confidential on the other side of this commercial break. You're listening to The Mind's Eye. We're back on The Mind's Eye with former Ranger Andrea Lankford, we're talking about her book, Ranger Confidential, Living, Working, and Dying in the National Parks. And before the commercial break, uh, we are going to jump into a, another big issue that the National Parks is dealing with uh, and is garnering some new attention um, in recent days. And that is the strange or the high number of strange unsolved missing people's cases. Um, Andrew, when, when you were working there, well, I guess first off, is this a real issue that the National Parks is dealing with or is it overblown? And, you know, subset, I guess, is it something that you noticed or dealt with when you were 
uh, a ranger? Yes, you know, I don't say it would be overblown. You you have to you have to take it relatively, you know, because there's missing people, tens of thousands of missing people all over the nation, and there are lots of missing people in our parks and forests as well. And there are uh, over a thousand that remain unsolved. And these unsolved cases go all the way back, you know, to Glacier National Park uh, in the 1900s. There's a famous unsolved case. I worked uh, several lost hiker cases. We found most of them. There's one I worked at the Grand Canyon, a a 21-year-old young man that went missing, and I was in charge of the search. Um, After about seven or ten days, it was time to shut down the search, and we had not found him. And I had to tell the father that it was time to wind down. And he just teared up. And it was so hard for me to see how my words um, just killed his hope. And because he knew it meant, you know, we thought his son was probably dead. And it bothered me, that case, because we didn't find that young man. Eventually, he was found the next year by some uh, maintenance guys. And I'm glad that he was found, but that just always stuck with me. It felt like I had failed because I hadn't found him sooner. So these missing hiker cases bother me. Um, Of course, I know there are a lot of natural hazards, wildlife, falls, exposure. But just as we were talking about, there's a lot of dangerous people in the parks, too. And so when there's an unsolved case like this, it brings up a lot of questions that worry people. And with all our technology, why in the world can't we find these people? Yeah, one specific investigator that uh, has been looking into this is, uh, and that I'm thinking of and I guess kind of referencing, is Dave Politis, um, who has written a series of books called Missing 411 about some of these strange disappearances. And he claims to uh, have seen some, you know, some of these disappearances. Of course, you know, hiking hikers going missing in the national parks, you know, sadly is common and and is expected. But some of the things that I guess he saw with some of these missing, like, you know, for example, he has a a bunch of cases where there'd be little children who would traverse, you know, sometimes hundreds of miles or, or slopes that would be almost impossible for an adult to do. But they would do not only traverse it, um, but they would traverse it. But, you know, they would travel in a very short amount of distance. Uh, I mean, is this something that these type of weirder, stranger cases, missing persons cases, did you ever notice any of these type of things? I, I, I'm I, familiar with Polita's work. He's done a lot of hard work documenting all these cases. Um, it, I think he has over 600 1,600 cases that he's found. I don't know if those are all in national parks or, or also just on federal land. Um, but he's done a lot of hard work documenting this. Now, with I personally have not seen a case where there's been a child that, you know, was later found in a strange place, the remains. Um, and usually I feel like if I study a case where the body's been found, I can come up with a reasonable explanation of what might have happened to them. But right now I'm working on a new project where there are three young men in the age 26 to 32 who went missing while through hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. And there are people out there who are working so hard to find them and they can't. And so much resources have been put to finding these young men, and they cannot be found. It is, I, I'm astounded. I'm almost speechless. I don't know what to say. I, I just can't believe that we can't find these people, knowing how much effort's been put into locating them. How did you get turned on to these cases? Uh, you know, there's. I was doing some research for a documentary about this missing hikers, and I found this case. Uh, the missing person, his name is Chris Sylvia, and when he was 28, he decided to hike the Pacific Crest Trail in Southern California. And he went missing uh, in February. They didn't find him, but they found his gear on the trail, right on the trail. And as a park ranger, I'm like, what? You found his gear, but you didn't find his him or his body. Yeah, never a good sign. Yeah, I just like, I don't know. I was like, that case can be solved. 
So I started, I took it upon myself to study the case. I contacted the family and I started researching and investigating. And I've turned up a lot of interesting leads, but I can't find him. And so I, I, there, it just stuns me. He, I know the search, initial search, they had dogs, they had helicopters, they had airplanes uh, with his gear there. I thought for sure he would be within, you know, a quarter mile, half a mile of his gear. Um, he's not in a place where you would get lost. It's not that kind of place. It's not even that dangerous of a place. The weather wasn't that bad. And he's experienced but, hiker as well? Uh, intermediate hiker, yes. Um, there's no place really to fall from. It's, you know, the area around there has been searched pretty heavily. We can't find him. Nobody can find him. Then 52 miles north of where he went missing, another young man goes to hike the Pacific Crest Trail. His name is David O'Sullivan, and he leaves Idlewild and hiking north into the San Jacinto Mountains. I know a very dedicated woman named Kathy Tarr has do devoted the last year of her life to try to find David O'Sullivan. She's hired helicopters. She's hired experts to hike. They've flown, they've got drones up there. They've flown airplanes up there and got images. They can't find him. And then the third one is Chris Fowler. He went missing in Washington October 12th, 2016. His mother, Sally Fowler, is this dedicated, formidable woman, very intelligent, did her own investigation. It's been one of the biggest searches in that state. They can't find him. It's just very strange. I, I'm stunned that at least not one of these young men can be found with all these resources being put to look for them. And has the family given any hints uh, about their mental, I guess, you know, some people, you know, I guess what could the reason sometimes people go out to, you know, to do bad things to themselves? Um, any indication uh, on that end? With uh, Chris Fowler in Washington, none. And David O'Sullivan, probably not at all. No, no hint of that. With Chris Sylvia, the first one I told you about, it's possible. It's possible he could, he was sad. He had lost his job. He'd broken up with some girlfriends. But still, if that's what happened, how come we can't find him? If you had to say what the reasons were, what, would you, what do you think it is if you had to pinpoint why they're missing? With Chris Sylvia, I don't know. It's It runs the gamut. I go back and forth from uh, Mount Lion. He intentionally disappeared. He's still alive. Uh, he killed himself somewhere where we can't find him. Um, he wandered off somewhere far away from his gear and got in trouble, and that's why we can't find him. Um, David O'Sullivan and Chris Fowler is possibly weather play the role mm. with them, but but, you know, this is common, um, you know, for people to get in trouble. It's something bad to happen to them. Um, it's not unheard of. But we find them. We find their bodies. Uh, these three can't be found yet. People are still trying, working very hard to find them. Yeah, I can't imagine how disconcerting it must be to be a ranger and obviously their family and without that answer. With past missing hikers um, cases. Have you ever seen anything, you know, explanation to why they went missing that weren't outside, you know, weather related um, or, you know, trying to hurt themselves or just got to get away? I mean, has there been anything like cult activities inside the park that you've ever noticed? Well, interesting you bring that up. I have never seen that before, but when I started to investigate the Pacific Crest Trail, there actually is a cult also on the Appalachian Trail that tries to recruit hikers to join there. They don't see themselves as a cult, but most other people do. A&E did a special on them. They're called the 12 Tribes, and they try to recruit hikers through hikers, people who want to hike long distance, like the Pacific Crest Trail. You know, it takes six months with the Appalachian Trail, five months, and you're, you're you know, you're sort of look at life differently when you're on the trail like that. And so this, these cult, this cult does try to recruit from the ranks of through hikers on long distance trails. 
And, and what is the cult doing? Like, what are they bringing them to do once they have this as a member? Uh, you farm and work. You give them all your possessions, and you farm and you work for free. You're like an indentured servant. But, but I mean, I'm, I don't want to make it sound too negative. I mean, they're also their community, and you know, you get buried and you have kids, and you know, it's a community that it you join. Like a commune it's, of sorts. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's not necessarily that sinister, although there are a lot of people that complain about the control issues. But they also cut people off from their family. You're not allowed to talk to your family. You're, um, you're discouraged. You're pretty much cloistered into their group. So it's like a forestry Scientologist. Uh, Scientologist. Well, <laughs> well maybe a, an organic farming Scientologist. <laughs> there we go. That's, yeah, that sounds yeah, much like better a, for sure. A hippie, a hippie Scientologist farming. Yeah. Some through hikers, they call them the, what do they call them? They call them the, cult farmers <laughs> uh now sticking with the the missing hikers um just thinking of possible solutions i've heard of you know sometimes outsiders um you know outsiders in society will go live in the national parks and, and sometimes even kidnap people have you ever encountered anything like that or is that more of like a a boogeyman story no that that i personally don't recall that no, wait a minute. At Yosemite, before I got there, this really creepy dude kidnapped a ranger. And she worked at, she was a ranger that works in the fee booth. And he kidnapped her with, uh, what do you call them, the, the uh, taser. She had a taser. And he drove her up into a remote area of the park, walked her in the woods, opened up a bag and had like this uh, Native American Indian costume in the bag. And was telling her she had to take off her clothes and put that on. And then that's when she said, you know, I'm going to die. So she started fighting him. Uh, they broke her finger in the fight, but she got away. Hmm. And he ran off and he, he got trapped in one of these cursed canyons, hmm. believe it or not. And he's hiking down this canyon. He got trapped. You know, he's between a, where he can't climb up and he can't climb down. He's in that canyon for 13 days before starving, before some rock climber sees him and recognizes him from the wanted posters. So they call the rangers, and the rangers went out there and arrested him. He's probably glad to be arrested at that point. Yeah. Uh, um, so uh, it does happen, yes. Uh, there's nothing better than instant karma right there, at least, right? Yeah, no, that was that actually was a happy ending story. It couldn't happen to a better dude, right? <laughs> yeah. Um all right, one more, I guess, stab uh, or a couple more questions on the missing persons hiker because I know that we got a little bit more to talk about. One more, I guess, try. Have you ever seen any illegal government activities, any agencies performing illegal government um, activities on the national parks lands? Um, no. You mean like like military exercise? Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, you know, so I'm like, I'll be in, you'll be in the middle, you know, doing the ranger thing, and then in the middle of nowhere, you, you encounter, you know, some type of, you know, I guess it could be a military agency, FBI, whatever, doing some type of uh, activity without, you know, I guess them telling no, you beforehand, no, maybe not even no, illegal, I guess. No, no alien autopsies or anything like <laughs> yeah. that. But, but, but you really remind me of something I saw was super weird. I was at Zion. I see all these guys in camouflage. Well, you know, a national park, you can't hunt. So that really raised my hackles. But I decided I'd do the Andy Griffith routine with them. And I just walked up. Hey, how you doing? And they go, we're fine. I go, what are you up to? They go, we're just enjoying the scenery. But the way they said it, just, oh, man, every hair on the back of my neck went up. And so I ran and told my supervisor. He goes, we'll put them under surveillance. Now, I couldn't surveil them because they had seen me. Long story short, they watch these guys and you know what they were up to they were going out to these remote swimming holes where people skinny dip and they were spying on naked women with rifle scopes mm. wearing camouflage you say so you some classic I, peeping toms huh you know i hate to scare people but you might be out skinny dipping in some remote pool and that's a dude that's up in the bushes doing that yeah, I mean, if you're willing to go skinny dipping, I guess you got to be willing to to be seen, right? <laughs> In some voyeurism. Yeah, works. well, I, I guess, but I don't know. That's pretty intense and creepy to me. Very organized, and they were doing it as a group. Um, they look like something that would escalate 
to a kidnapping to me. Mm. Yeah, well, good thing I guess you know you got your eyes on that. Thank God for you Rangers too to to keep your eyes on on these things. And and we were talking about Dave Politis and and a big issue that he says he encounters, and I think you can shed some light on this, is that when he requests um, a list of missing people in the national parks, he gets uh, you know a response saying that they national parks don't keep a list of uh, missing peoples. Is that true? I think it is, Brian. And I mean, when I say don't keep a list, I mean, your individual park, like Yosemite, they probably have a list. But n- nationwide, they're not charting this. They're not studying it. I, I mean, maybe they are right now, but I think part of the reason he didn't get a list is because they don't, they didn't have it available to give him. And I don't, I think they, I think there's some bureaucrats in the Park Service sitting on their butt in an office somewhere in Washington who can spend a couple of days making a list. That's my opinion. Um, so I think Pilates brought up a good issue that the park might as well be tracking that. So, have that so in the- why don't they then? If you think, you know, you're a ranger, you think that, you know, a former ranger, you think that they should. Clearly, there's some, you know, we're highlighting this issue right now. Why aren't they? Well, first off, I want to say I bet my, you know, my, uh, they're not my colleagues because, you know, mine are all my age and close to retirement now. But I'm sure in Grand Canyon, Yosemite, they have a list. So I I just want to, individual parks, some of them probably have a list. So my complaint is with the national level leadership priorities. That's not one of their priorities to answer your question. That's what I think. They don't have a list because it's not a priority for them to have a list. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of scary. I, to me, it doesn't seem like it takes that much effort to, to digitize and, and to put together a database. But Yeah, uh, no, I, no, I agree with you. It needs to be done. Hopefully there's somebody working on it now because the Pilates has given this, you know, brought attention to this. Let's trail back to some of the stories in Ranger Confidential. Uh, again, we're with Andrea Lankford talking about her book, Ranger Confidential, Living, Working, and Dying in the National Parks. We've talked a lot about the Grand Canyon, but we haven't talked too much about Yosemite. So let's see if we can just kind of stick in a story there. Uh, and one of the, the rangers featured in your book was uh, Ranger Mary, uh, who was really an extraordinary human being. Uh, she she broke stereotypes. I mean, she was the valley girl who, who captured felons and criminals. And one particularly amazing story was the, her rescue at Yosemite. Uh, you mind sharing a little bit about Mary and that infamous story there? Yeah, the one off of El Capitan. Mm-hmm. She did. She did lots of rescues. Mm-hmm. Mary Lethal Henson. She is extraordinary. I'm very fond of her. Uh, but yeah, the big one that she did. Now she was a young ranger, so she, you know, she had to prove herself. And there were some got, climbers that got stuck on El Capitan. Now, El Capitan is taller than the Empire State Building, and it's a sheer cliff. The, for those of you that haven't seen it. And so there's some rock climbers in April. They get caught in a snowstorm, and they're stuck up there freezing to death. And so at first, Mary, they, they send a team. They can't fly, so they send a team to go in on snowmobiles up from the top. They're going to lower them down. Well, they get snowed in for the night, and the next day, uh, the, the sun oh, comes out, and they have a window to fly. Well, because Mary is part of the B team, she's sitting on the bench, um, and she's a girl, so there are 10 to knots in the girls back then. And so this weather window opens up. They don't have anybody left because the A-team's up on the, in the snowstorm. So they have to send Mary. So they fly her up, and she gets all geared up on the top of El Capitan, and she's hanging off the edge, getting ready to go. And here comes one of the older rangers. His name is Keith Lober. And he's notorious for being very intimidating and having a bad temper. He's an awesome ranger, though. He loved to work with him. But he sees Mary, and he's like, no, off the rope. He's going to put a more experienced male rescuer on the rope. But Mary won't have it, so she refuses to let go of the rope, and Lober has to send her over the edge. So after fighting Lober to get to go on the rescue, Mary rappels down to these climbers, and they help her onto the ledge, and as soon as one of them gets one look at her, he goes, oh, no, it's a chick. Hmm. He's getting ready to freeze to death, but he's upset that he, they sent a woman to rescue him. <laughs> and his dumbass fault, too. Yeah, exactly. But one of the other guys says, well, I prefer to see her as a guardian angel. And so they end up, they have to send the guys climbing up the rope back to the top of El Capitan, and then 
once they all climb up, then Mary has to climb up these icy ropes. It's very scary. It's like two climb, you know, two pushes up the rope and a slide down. But she gets to the top and she she did an excellent job and kind of proved herself. Um, she was probably the first or second woman to do a high angle rescue like that on El Capitan. And you know what pissed me off the most about about that story is that they didn't even give her the next full-time job that opened up in that in that group <laughs> she did eventually uh, you're right she did eventually get a full-time job at yosemite but i ended up hiring her at the grand canyon after that she worked for me yeah thank thankfully for you and yeah. um and i know this is something that just like mary you, you know you encountered you know a lot of issues when you're trying to break that glass ceiling and and obviously, like any other office, the National Parks has office politics and, and, and major systemic issues. In your 12 years, did you, did you face, um, I guess, any or really a lot of discrimination? Um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, the Department of Interior and the National Park Service has a bad reputation um, for how they treat women. And there were times where I didn't feel that at all, but eventually the longer I was with the agency, the worse it got. And it just not, you know, there was a time where I was the only one of my uh, grade that, that didn't have my own office. All of my male peers had their own office. I didn't, um, you know, I got, people said things to me. Um, but a lot of the worst for me was just watching how all the women were treated. Um, and not promoted as easily and, and had to work twice as hard for half the recognition. And then now today, it really makes me sad to see, you know, Grand Canyon had a really bad incident with women being assaulted uh, sexually down on the river. And they had a big shake up there. Um, so, yeah, that's a problem. It's still a problem in the Department of Interior. It's unfortunate. Shouldn't be. I was going to ask, I mean, since, you know, with, with the Me Too movement, a lot of industries and, uh, you know, taking a hard look at themselves and, and the policies and, and the actions that, that, that they've conducted and, and let go. Uh, I mean, have you seen any change at all since at least the, you know, Me Too movement ha has started in, in the national parks? To me, the biggest change is the public listens and, and is sympathetic where I feel like when I worked with the agency, you, you knew to put up or shut up. And if you verbalized a problem, you were going to be blacklisted for the rest of your career. You certainly didn't feel like coming out to the public, you were going to get any support from the public either. So that's the big difference to me. I think the public sentiment has changed and they're more likely to be supportive and listen to women who make complaints like this. Well, you got to start the conversation, and 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 hopefully we can we can get the change uh, over in the NPS, uh, you know, little by little, I guess. But uh, that doesn't really help you or any of the rangers that you know that are still working there. But uh, and just sticking with some of the, I guess, the the politics of uh, the national parks, and maybe you can elaborate this uh, on this for a little bit uh, for me. You know, from the outside looking in, I thought the national parks generate a you know a fair amount of money, but you've mentioned that the park rangers have to pay for their own on-site housing, um, additional training if they want to advance in their careers. Uh, is it me or is the National Parks claiming poverty or are they actually underfunded? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, like I talked about priorities, priorities earlier. You know, sometimes I see that as the problem, that there's money there. It's just how it's spent. Um, there is a little bit of element in the National Park Service that doesn't really like law enforcement rangers. They feel that they're an unnecessary evil. Um, so sometimes that causes a problem with priorities. Um, but also, you know, the backlog with the maintenance that, you know, it, it's deplorable with some of the buildings and all that needs to be repaired and improved. Uh, it's going to take millions and millions of dollars. So I guess to answer your question, it's both in my mind. How would you fix the NPS, the national parks? What would be, uh, at least what would be the, one of the first couple things that you would do, you would institute? Um, well, I think I would move people out of the regional offices and out of D.C. into the parks themselves. <laughs> yeah, so they can get a real taste, huh? 
Yeah, and also because, you know, I feel like a lot of the programs that they do, like a lot of money was spent to make the parks relevant. In my point is, what? I, I don't know. I don't know if that should be your priority. Maybe your priority should be make the parks safe and a good, comfortable place to visit um, and protected more than making them relevant. They'll be relevant. But that's just my opinion. I think that was a lot of money spent on a big program. And now what happens is now the visitation levels are show up and the staffing can't, you know, maintain uh, for the the, vis the visitation levels are going up while the staffing's going down in the parks. Because of something that, you know, I guess because of everything that we've mentioned over the past 45 minutes, you know, seeing death after death, uh, being treated poorly by visitors and coworkers, uh, a common occurrence or something that was common and talked about in the book was ranger burnout. Um, and maybe I was looking for something more, but you, I mean, maybe you, it seemed like you surprisingly didn't really focus on how your career ended. Uh, was it, was Ranger Burnout the reason you retired? Ranger Burnout, yeah, was a big reason. Um, I was very worn out. I was very frustrated. Um, I, was, I felt I was overworked. I was working more hours and losing a lot of sleep. I felt underpaid for how much stress and... Um, hassle that I had to deal with in my job and just in the complexity of it and the importance of it. Um, I also was getting tired of the discrimination, quite frankly. I, I just, I didn't see a future where as a woman, I was going to be nurtured and supported to a level that I felt I was going to need going forward. So I think all that qualifies as burnout perhaps you know if maybe if I wasn't burnt out that stuff wouldn't have mattered as much but um, I it was a good decision for me I'm a nurse now and I'm much happier as a nurse quite frankly you know I've always been a nurse as long as I was a ranger and it's been a more um, accepting profession for me do you find now that I guess you've had equal amount of time on both sides as a nurse and as a ranger would you say one's more rewarding for the other? Uh, excuse me, one's more rewarding than the other? Not in the sense of how, you know, because the job is rewarding for how you feel like you're accomplishing something important. Um, I feel like nursing is very important and being a ranger was very important. So that aspect was both equally fulfilling. But as far as how I'm rewarded by uh, externally, by the public, by my patients, by my superiors, I'm more rewarded in nursing. There's no doubt. Uh, I'm paid better. As a nurse. <laughs> that always helps too. Yeah. <laughs> if someone was to go up to you and ask you, should I be a ranger? What would you tell them? Yes or no? And I have to say yes or no. I'd probably say no. Mm. Or I'd say, do it for a couple of years, get it out of your system, then go into something else. Before reading the book, I've always wanted to be a ranger. I thought working there would be amazing. And, and now, after reading the book, I, I know I can't cut it, quite frankly. So thank God <laughs> for people like you uh, and, and, and all your other rangers, too. Yeah. Well, there are other, you know, there are the other types of rangers. There's the naturalist rangers, and there's maintenance, and they're biologists. So there are other avenues in the park service where you could work. And there are parts of it that were great. And part of my issue was I worked at these really big, busy parks, that really challenged the staffing. Um, that's I did, like you said. There was a lot. I had a lot of great experiences. I met my husband in Yosemite, so I'm glad I did it. And before I let you go, uh, can can we expect a sequel to Ranger Confidential? What's next for you? You're such a great writer. I hope there's more. Yeah, I'm working on another book right now, and it's going to be about these missing hikers on the Pacific Crest Trail and the people who are looking for them. And do you have a expected time or is it uh, of a, you know, debut or is it a little too early right now to say? Yeah, it's too early. I got a lot of work to do. Well, we appreciate the work that you put in and obviously coming here and, and I'm going to hold you to the Haunted Hikes Halloween episode. And, and obviously whenever we, we get out this other Pacific Trail crest, uh, missing persons, we'll have you on for that as well. Uh, Andrea, really, truly much obliged for sharing your R-rated ranger life with the mind's eye. <laughs> 
You're welcome, Brian. Have a good night. Can't wait to talk to you again. Extinguishing the campfire that is this episode on the Mind's Eye wrap-up after a word from our sponsors. Time to take that long trip down the mountain back to home as the Mind's Eye wraps up here. And I know it may not sound like it from this interview, but traveling, it does leave you speechless. Then it turns you into a storyteller. And when humanity, nature, and the mind's eye collides, you know it makes for one hell of a good story. And there's still so many stories left to tell. And we'll be back in a few weeks to go over a few more. And I know you want to know who it is, but I am running out of time, but aren't really the best gift surprises. But if you can't wait, just go to our website, themindseyemedia.com, themindseyemedia.com. And in the meantime, make your own story. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. The Mind's Eye returns in just a few weeks. This is Z Talk Radio.